the rest of us are in Leviticus chapter 3, so if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn there. If not, there should be a Bible on a chair near you. Anybody else admit that their Bible automatically opens up the Leviticus now? <laughs> that can't be too common, um, but... I've noticed it's certainly true uh, in uh, my Bible. Uh, we're in Leviticus chapter 3. This is the third of five gifts that you can bring to God. It's the last one that is voluntary. So let's read chapter 3, and we'll dive right in. If someone's offering is a fellowship offering, and he offers an animal from the herd, whether male or or he is to present before the Lord an animal without defect. He is to lay his hand on the head of his offering and slaughter it at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Then Aaron's sons, the priests, shall, shall sprinkle the blood against the altar on all sides. From the fellowship offering, he is to bring a sacrifice made to the Lord by fire. All the fat that covers the inner parts or is connected to them, both kidneys with the fat on them near the loins, and the covering of the liver, which he will remove with the kidneys. Then Aaron's sons are to burn it on the altar on top of the burnt offering that is on the burning wood as an offering made by fire, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. If he offers an animal from the flock as a fellowship offering to the Lord, he is to offer a male or female without defect. If he offers a lamb, he is to present it before the Lord. He is to lay his hand on the head of his offering and slaughter it in front of the tent of meeting. Then Aaron's son shall <laughs> sprinkle its blood against the altar on all sides. From the fellowship offering, he is to bring a sacrifice made to the Lord by fire. Its fat, the entire fat tail, cut off close to the backbone. All the fat that covers the inner parts or is connected to them, both kidneys with the fat on them near the loins, and the covering of the liver, which he will remove with the kidneys. The priest shall burn them on the altar as food, an offering made to the Lord by fire. If his offering is a goat, he is to present it before the Lord. He is to lay his hand on its head and slaughter it in front of the tent of meeting. <clears throat> then Aaron's son shall sprinkle its blood against the altar on all sides. From what he offers, he is to make this offering to the Lord by fire. All the fat that covers the inner parts or is connected to them, both kidneys with the fat on them near the loins, and the covering of the liver, which he will remove with the kidneys. The priest shall burn them on the altar as food, an offering made by fire, a pleasing aroma. All the fat is the Lord's. This is a lasting ordinance for the generations to come, wherever you live. You must not eat any fat or any blood. This is the word of the Lord for us this morning. Let's bow our heads and pray to our loving God. God, thank you for your word to instruct our lives. As we saw in that video just a short time ago, the power of your gospel, the work that you've done in and through Jesus Christ to impact our lives is very, very real. And we are grateful for that. We thank you for your love and your mercy and the peace that you extend to us. This morning I humbly ask that you would speak to us so that we can understand more of who you are and what you're calling us to be about, the people that you've, you desire for us to be. I pray that you would have your way and that we would listen. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The third offering is variously known as the fellowship offering, or perhaps the peace offering. Anybody have anything different in their Bible? Thanksgiving. A Thanksgiving offering. They all kind of are focused on the same kinds of things. 
It's actually a, uh, the word that describes this offering is a mashup of two words. And one of the words we're probably familiar with, especially if you've read the Bible at any length, it's the word in Hebrew, shalom, which is peace. It's also the greeting that every uh, Hebrew or Israelite person would say to each other when they'd pass each other on the street, uh, whenever they would just simply, it was the equivalent of saying hi, but there was so much more behind it. And peace is a really difficult thing to, to describe and to explain to somebody. It's one of those things that if you've experienced peace in your life, real peace, not just temporary, oh, I feel good about what, what's happening in life, but irregardless of the circumstances of life, when you have that deep peace, it is a really difficult thing to communicate to somebody who's never experienced it. And yet it's an anchor that absolutely makes you um, understand that it's okay even if the world around us is not okay. Let me attempt to describe peace in a variety of ways. In my house, in the living room, I couldn't have said this actually to you, but I, I spent a lot of time in my living room the last two weeks um, not feeling good and and in the corner, on the wall, is some art, and it says simply, peace. It's made out of five images of natural things, in some cases man-made things, that look like the letters that spell out peace. And then underneath it is John 14, 27. You know that verse? Jesus, just before he uh, has, you know, his last encounters with his disciples before his death, he is, he's making all kinds of commitments to the disciples. He's telling them part of what is going to happen. He prays for them. And as part of all of this, he says that he's going to have the Holy Spirit come as a gift. He's going to be a counselor in Jesus' absence. But in verse 27 of John chapter 14, he says this, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Encapsulated in what Jesus says there is part of the understanding of peace. He's not guaranteeing the disciples that, you know, you were the ones that were close to me. You got to experience all this good stuff. And yes, there's a moment in front of us that's going to be difficult. And then everything in life is going to be just fine. You're not going to have any problems. That's not what he says. And yet he still leaves his peace. It is this anchor that holds us together despite, in spite of things that are in front of us. If we come to more modern times, I don't know how many of you listen to country music, but Zach Brown, the Zach Brown band, had this line in one of their very first hit songs, and it says this, There's no dollar sign on a peace of mind, this I've come to know. And I don't know if they actually know what they're saying when they write that, but it's absolutely true. There are so many advantages in our world to being a rich person or being a person of influence or being somebody who other people want to pay attention to. But when it comes to peace, you can't buy it no matter how rich you are. You can't earn it uh, just because you're an influential person. Peace comes from God. And you can't put a price tag on it. And if we turn yet to another example, think of this hymn written down, which many of us have uh, in our minds by memory. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Even 
despite the wide range of things that we might be experiencing, we have the reassurance that even when everything else goes away, we have the, the assurance of salvation, which means that our souls are okay. Which means even in death, we come out victorious. I don't know about you, but when I look at the news, that is absolutely reassuring. And I'm not really sure how people make it through without having a complete breakdown, especially those who don't know Jesus Christ. What we see in Leviticus chapter 3 is what by now should be a familiar cadence or a rhythm to the song of life. If you turn to the Psalms, you notice that there's lots and lots of artistry in the Psalms, in the Psalms of the Bible. Uh, they're, they're beautiful, the images that are declared, that they often have this rhythm to them. And some of them have repetition, just like we see in Leviticus. Um, there's a particular Psalm that actually talks about... Um, his love endures forever. It's, it's inserted every single line in the, in the psalm. And one of the things that, that we notice about Leviticus is it is very artistic, but in a different sort of way. It's a beauty that has an acquired taste, if you will. Because there's lots and lots of details in Leviticus. There's not necessarily beautiful language the imagery makes us cringe in many ways because of the blood and, and the fat and the death and animals and the whole nine yards that just seem so foreign to us. And yet, if you notice, even just three chapters in, we notice this regular rhythm, right? There are animals or there are grains that can be offered. There's usually three different options. Sometimes within those options... There are several other options. It shows that God allows people from all kinds of backgrounds to approach Him, even if they're dirt poor. But do you notice the line that keeps on appearing again and again and again throughout the first three chapters that keeps focusing us on what this is really all about? Anybody know what it is? As an aroma to the Lord. That's it, right there. Yeah, yeah. Blood's part, a big part of it, and we'll uh, we'll certainly dive in there deeper. But it's the the res it's the response that reminds us that everything that's happening in Leviticus one, two, and three is really about us pleasing God, about us uh, about us bringing the very best so that God can smile down upon us. And it's about being able to approach God Himself. Again, that should really be shocking to us, that we can approach the God who created us, the one who knows our flaws even better than we do, and knows that we have done wrong. This is the cadence of Leviticus. And after a while, you come to realize, wow, in the, in the enactment of these, of these uh, rituals, you can actually put action to what you um, feel in your faith experience, what you know in your mind, and what is going on at the deepest levels of who you are as a person. It's hard to notice this at first in Leviticus chapter 3, but the peace offering... I'm going to choose to call it the peace offering uh, primarily because that seems to be the focus of so much of what this offering is about. It's about the reassurance of being in God's presence and knowing no matter what's going on that God holds things together. But this is a sacred meal experience. <coughs> And it's very subtly described here in chapter 3, but then is brought more to the forefront in chapter 7. So remember, the first five chapters are the five different gifts that you can bring to God from the perspective of the giver, the person who's bringing the offering. And then 
chapters 6 and 7 are from the perspective of the priest. Here's what the priest is supposed to do when a person brings a gift. And if you look in Leviticus chapter 3, in verses 11 and 16, there's a word that's inserted in there, and the way that it's described in English almost makes it sound like it's something that just gets burnt up. The priest shall burn them, these items, the fat, liver, those kinds of things, on the altar as food, an offering made to the Lord by fire. And again in verse 16, the priest shall burn them on the altar as food. If we look at chapter 7, we'll notice there's an entire section that describes that it's a particular part of the animal, specifically the right breast. And... Uh, several other parts that are specifically set aside for the priest and for his sons. And I, I had this conversation with somebody last week. I don't remember if it was here or over at Drake Town, and I can't remember who it was. But they asked me, they said, what happened when there was excess food that was provided and the priest couldn't eat all of it? Well, you have an entire tribe of people, the Levites, who are not allowed to own land because they are set apart and their duty in serving the Lord is to be priests. And they were reliant 100% on the gifts that people brought to the temple, especially the fellowship or peace offering, because that could be taken to any person in their tribe. And so you would take the food, the priests would take the food, from the day, take it home, give it to their wives, their children, to their extended family. And this is how they stayed alive. And so this was an important aspect of this. But in particular, as it related to the temple itself, you actually had a meal when you presented God with a peace offering. You had a meal as the giver with the priest and with God himself. That should be very radical in our minds and in thought process in which we understand what's going on here. There are a couple of things that are really difficult to understand here. And so let's just face them head on and then we'll uh, un unwrap this sacred meal just a little bit more. The first thing is that most peace offerings, peace offerings were common in the ancient Near East even outside of the Israelite world, you would bring a peace offering to uh, help uh, a king accept you and, and allow you to be in their presence. You would bring a peace offering to somebody maybe that you've wronged and you want to make them feel good about things, kind of forget about the past and move on to the future. And it's not a stretch at all to understand that the peace offering or the fellowship offering was really an appeasement offering. It was to make somebody forget about the bad stuff in the past or what could potentially happen and bring, in some cases, those who were hostile toward each other a little bit closer. And this was often commenced with a meal. They would sit down and eat a meal together. It's completely different, the, the peace offering that's described for us in Leviticus chapter 3. Because this is not about appeasing God. God actually welcomes the giver, the ordinary person, to come into his presence and to share a meal with both him and the priest to have this sacred meal right there in the center of the most sacred place on earth, the tabernacle or the tent of meeting, or later still in Israel's history, the temple. And so it wasn't about manipulating God. It wasn't about appeasing Him as though we could actually make things right with Him. It was all about enjoying the presence of one another. This is completely 
out of, in, out of left field compared to the culture of that day. You look at the gods and goddesses, the deities that various cultures worshipped, there was a universal fear of God. Fear to the point that you always were worried that you had somehow upset this god or goddess. And so you were constantly making peace offerings, appeasement offerings, really, to try to keep them at bay. And so you would have a god or goddess of everything that you can possibly imagine. The god of, of agriculture, the god of war, the god of, goddess of fertility. It didn't matter whatever area of your life that you were experiencing something, there was a god or a goddess for that. And so you always had to make sure that you hadn't upset them so that you could ultimately avoid their wrath. Do you notice the contrast here in Leviticus chapter 3? Again, remember, these are draw near gifts. God wants you in his presence. But there's a particular way in which you get to approach him. A second thing that we notice here in Leviticus chapter 3, and I know some of you are talking about this because uh, I was chatting with somebody on the way in. You notice that blood is at the forefront of Leviticus chapter 3, again. But there's also a focus on fat, a lot of focus on fat. There's fat that, that surrounds the kidneys, there's fat that surrounds the liver, there's just fat in general. And you think, okay... So we're talking about animals losing their lives. We're talking about blood. That makes us squeamish enough. Have you actually seen fat? You've eaten meat before, right? You know what the fat looks like? It's not the most uh, beautiful thing in the world, right? And yet, it's not allowed to be consumed by the giver. Why? Well, we see, let's start with the easier of the two. We, we see and understand that the blood in an animal is what gives it life. If you look at Leviticus chapter 17, it talks about never consuming blood from an animal because that is where life is from. And so you can't drink or consume the blood because that would be desecrating the life of the animal. But fat, why fat? Why fat today, if you go and get a good ribeye steak, the thing that gives it flavor, that makes it taste good, is the fat. And of course, we don't want to eat a big haunch of fat, but, but that's what makes it taste like a steak. <coughs> Excuse me. In the ancient Near East, when you were raising an animal, it was a subsistence kind of living for most people. Almost everybody, they couldn't afford the animal to die, and yet they couldn't afford to give it the very best. They didn't have, in most cases, uh, enough grain to give the animal to reach its fullest potential. They were satisfied if they could keep it alive. Today, if you've talked to any farmers, you know that it is, if they're raising a steer, for instance, or a sheep or a goat, you put as much grain in front of that animal as it will possibly consume, because you want to fatten it up. It'll weigh more. The, the meat will taste better. But when you don't have enough, The animal doesn't become fat. And so <coughs> the fat, <coughs> excuse me, the fat itself is a rarity. It's not common like it is today. Today we've bred animals over the course of time to get bigger and bigger. Have you seen how chickens have gotten larger over time? Have you ever looked at that, at those of you who raise chickens? And the, the, the chicken that used to be raised back in the 1950s, so much smaller. In, in its body, but it's so that we get a finished product, if you will, 
in a much more short, uh, shortened length of time. So this, this fat guards many of the most important organs of the body, the liver, the kidneys, the things that are connected to the bloodline. And so it was reserved solely for God because it was the very best part. You'll even notice in Leviticus chapter 3 that it describes a particular kind of sheep, the flat tail, that the, the Jewish people started breeding, especially once they reached the promised land, that it had this, this extra strip of fat down its back. And whenever somebody brought one of those to the temple, it was a sign that you were giving your very best to God. One more thing that I want us to focus on that often gets lost, culturally speaking. This is the meal, or the gift, that are stated. This is the gift that involves a meal that brings together heaven and earth. The, the giver, the person bringing the gift, well, they're just an ordinary person like you and me, a sinner, broken, unable to approach the holy God of the universe, except that God has made a way. And so the giver brings this gift, and just like in chapter 1, the burnt offering, it is the giver that takes the life of the animal, presents it to God, takes its life, and then it's the priest, those who actually are the bridge between heaven and earth, that carry out the sacrifice itself, <coughs> who bring the blood to the altar to present this before God. But this is the one gift where then you sat down and had a meal together. Now, I want you to imagine this with me. You've got a tabernacle. You've got priests doing what they do. They're keeping the fire lit so that sacrifices can continue to be presented on the altar. They're cleaning out the charred parts and putting them on the disposal pile. They may be carrying food back to <coughs> back to camp so that uh, they can feed their families. But at any given time, there are multiple people at the tabernacle. And let's say a bunch of you have decided to bring God a peace offering. You sit down and you have a meal together with the priests and with God himself. We tend to think of things today very individualistically in our Christian world. It's just part of, uh, in many ways, our our Western values, and especially our American values, where we value individualism. And there's something of merit behind that. Because every one of us has to come before the Lord. We can't ride the coattails of our parents or of other people. We stand before the Lord. But there's a communal aspect to our faith that is often missing. And that's why we take communion together. We celebrated communion last week. That's another good word that describes what this gift is all about. It's about communion, coming together, the unity of experiencing God's goodness. And so, with those things in mind, let's talk about some food. When you ate with somebody in the ancient Near East it meant that you accepted them. You received them. The most intimate thing that you could do with a stranger or 
the acquaintance was to have them over to your house and have a meal with them. You'd recline around the table, and you always wanted to show really good hospitality. And so you would present them with food that was the best. And in doing so, you showed that you received them at the deepest level. <coughs> You're probably familiar with the fact that there are, were laws that were in existence in Jesus' day where Jewish people were only allowed to eat with Jewish people. You can see why in Matthew chapter 9, for example then, when Jesus <coughs> calls Levi, also known as Matthew, who at that time is a tax collector, and then Jesus shows up at his house with a bunch of tax collectors and sinners. Should I fill in what that means? That's like the... The, uh, that, that's like the, the prostitutes and the people who, who sin and kind of flaunt it to everybody. Like, it's not a big deal. I don't care if you see me sin. That was their mentality. And yet Jesus goes there and has a meal with them. And what does that communicate? The Pharisees are not happy when they see this. Because they know that Jesus is accepting them. Of course, we know elsewhere that he doesn't condone their sin, but rather there's the recognition that there's hope for people like this too. I think oftentimes we, we like to put ourselves in, in certain categories. Well, you know, me, I'm a sinner, but I'm not that big. Right? We like to rank ourselves. We'll talk about that more in a couple of weeks. But remember, when they start to murmur, that's when Jesus says, it's not, the, it's not the healthy that need a doctor, it's the sick. And go figure out what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. They've missed the loving component. They've missed the gracious component of the sacrificial system. And he, he says, Jesus says, you can follow all the laws... And make yourself feel good about who you are. But if you're missing the gracious aspect, you miss the whole point altogether. And so, having a meal with somebody was acceptance in that world. What does this say about God? A holy God, who's perfect in every way, who cannot be corrupted by sin but still chooses, because of the sacrifice of the animal, to welcome the sinner in. Amen. Is that the mentality that we have with the people around us that we rub shoulders with, our co-workers, our, our family members, our neighbors, fellow students, and, and people that we see on a regular basis? Eating also, I think it's really essential for us to consider this, was all about nourishment. Today, oftentimes, we eat because it's pleasurable. We don't really need to eat in many cases. We do it because, well, sometimes because we're bored. Sometimes because it goes well with an activity that we're doing, maybe watching TV or a movie. We'll even go out to celebrate something special, maybe get ice cream or some kind of dessert, not because we need more calories for the day, but because it's part of the celebration itself. In the ancient Near East, a meal was all about nourishment. Without it, you die. I don't mean one single meal, but they lived very much a daily bread kind of existence. And so the meal was a reminder that life was valuable. And it was anchored in the earthiness, if you will, that food kept you alive. So when you gathered to bring the peace offering, the fellowship offering, 
and you ate that meal, it was a reminder that God provided. That he was the source of all good things. And that your very life was dependent upon him. And then there's the stuff of life that happens when we eat. One of the greatest things that we have sold ourselves short on in the modern world in which we live is not eating meals together as families. It is so easy to, to not make it a priority to be there for the meal. Or... Maybe we have the meal, but we all go to our own little safe places. In some cases, that may be our bedrooms. In some cases, that may be the living room. And we, we turn the TV on. And, or have you gone out to eat recently? Do this the next time you do. And as you're sitting there eating, look around at the families that are eating. And every one of them... And so we can be in each other's presence, right? But we're checked out mentally. We're not really having the stuff of life conversations. There's such important stuff that happens while we're eating. When you talk about the things that are going on, have gone on during the day. The good and the bad. You, you invite God into your meal when you pause, you bow your head and you pray. And you thank God for the food that you have before you. Amen. And then you, you discuss all kinds of stuff. It doesn't have to be this deep philosophical or even theological stuff. It's the fact that you care about each other, that you love each other. And this is what could take place during the peace offering, in the most sacred place on earth, right there in the temple. But the amazing thing is that, that we have that opportunity every single time we eat as a family. Amen. Don't, don't lose the opportunity. I'm not, saying, I'm not trying to be legalistic. Have I ever looked at my phone while, while the fa our family is eating together? Of course. But it is really a good reminder that 20 years ago, we survived without those things. <laughs> if we're then looking for what this looks like, how Jesus fulfills this, we've already mentioned about Matthew chapter 9, but there are literally probably more than 100 references that... This Leviticus chapter 3 foreshadows these upcoming meals that are going to take place. We don't have time to dive into Isaiah and, and, and some of the other prophets that talk about the Messianic banquet that is going to take place. Mm -hmm. Where only those who have an invitation because of Jesus Christ get to be there. You ever have somebody... Who's getting married, a couple, and you just, you desperately want to be a part of their special day. Because you want to celebrate with them. But you can't just show up, at least that's not mannerly to do that. You have to get an invitation. And that's what it talks about. Jesus mentions this multiple times. Toward the end of the Gospel of Matthew, he tells three parables in chapters 23 and 24 about some of what this is going to look like. And it's all foreshadowed for us in Leviticus chapter 3. The last meal that he has with his disciples, communion, the Lord's Supper, this is in many ways the fulfillment of Leviticus chapter 3. But notice what happens. The meal itself is transformed because it, it was originally that the giver brings something. In the case of the Passover meal, this was a lamb of perfection. 
without lunch. You provided that. And that's the meal that they're celebrating on that night in which Jesus is betrayed. But the amazing thing is that it looks forward to a day, just a day away, where the lamb will be provided in the body of Jesus Christ. And so whenever we consume communion together, we're actually, in many ways, reenacting this peace offering. Amen. But the offering is provided by God himself, by Jesus, with his death on the cross. The meal is transformed. But I want to challenge us, next Sunday is a fellowship meal Sunday. We have these fellowship meals not just to put more things on the schedule, but because real conversation happens during that time. We get to, to work out in detail who we are as people and how we relate to God and what the details are of the stuff in our lives. And we get to bounce that off of other people who are trying to pursue Jesus Christ and His way of living. That has the absolute ability to be transformative in our lives. But I want to take it even farther and, and, and dare you to make every meal that you sit down to recognize that it has the ability to be sacred. Because you always have the opportunity to invite God into that meal. And you also get to have the blessing of sitting around a table, whether it's out at a public restaurant or more frequently at home, around your dinner table, to share in conversation that very well may transform somebody. It's oftentimes not what's said in that one meal. It's the accumulation of hundreds of meals together that really go deep into somebody's life and have the impact that is positive and life-giving. Could it be that part of the reason why so many <clears throat> children and youth and young adults don't understand who they are, the identity that God has given them, the ability to do what God is, has called them to do because we haven't, we haven't spent the time to do those little things that are right in front of us all the time like meals together. And then we pay the price as a society, as families, even as Christians. The challenge today, I believe, for all of us is to allow that which seems so basic, so calm, to become sacred again. Mm -hmm. When we share in communion every month, may we recognize that God is present in that moment and that that meal is always sacred. Let's pray. God, thank you for this this time that we can gather together as your people. Thank you that you have brought each of us here, not by mistake, that you're shaping and forming this community. I pray if there is sin in, in our community that you would make us aware of it, that we might be right with you and with each other. Lord, I pray that you would give us the ability to see anew the sacred opportunities you hold out in front of us to bring peace. That anchor which is so hard to describe but only comes from you that sustains us even when times are dark. Give us your vision. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people say. Amen. Amen.